All right, here we go. History of Western civilization, the 16th century. I hope you guys believe me when I say I am actually trying to keep these short, right? Think about the fact we would normally have covered a century every two or three days, right? The way our schedule was going. And if we'd done this course the regular way, we would have covered a century every two weeks. So we really are cramming a lot in a small space. So don't be alarmed. So why do the slides keep getting longer and longer and longer? Here's part of your problem, okay? Um, you can't see anything off to the left of this graph, but if you could, so stretching off into the nowhere, it would have been almost a completely flat line. Teeny, teeny, tiny growth rate, okay? What happens in a couple hundred years, after 17, 1750 or so, okay, all of a sudden, Disease and starvation are only killing some of the people instead of most of the people, okay? In 1600, half of all infants die before they turn one, okay? Um, longer lifespans, more children living to adulthood, all kinds of things change our life expectancy and our general health as a species, okay? And once more people live than die, you're gonna get exponential growth, okay? It's really amazing. That leads to so many more things happening per century, and it makes it hard to keep the time under control, all right? So don't let this graph alarm you, though. Um, we actually, we are on track. This this graph is from um, more than a decade ago, but it's still correct. Um, we're right at 8 billion, just under 8 billion people now. But don't worry. <laughs> There's a lot of room on our planet for those people. If you put the entire world population in Texas, it would divide pretty much like this. So all the people from China would fit here, all, you know, and that, that includes the rest of Asia, India, Africa, okay. Um, and each person would get between 250, 300 square feet of space completely to themselves, right? So that's a little bigger than the 12th grade room at school, okay? For just you, not for a family, for you, all by yourself, okay? There's a lot of room on this planet. We're making fun of the medievals, right? I didn't know how big the planet was. It's big. There's plenty of plenty of space, plenty of stuff. Anyway, so that's what's leading to <clears throat> our slides getting long. In 1502, I didn't even say this is the 16th century, but you know it's the 16th century. That would be from 1500 to 1599. In 1502, Christopher Columbus begins his fourth and last journey to the Caribbean. He still believes the islands he has found are off, somewhere off the coast of India. All right. The Spaniards will spend another hundred years actively looking for a simple, straight path through this big, dumb, whatever it is, island, peninsula, continent thing that's in their way getting to China. All right. The last people to look for a water route through the Americas in some way, shape, or form, it was usually called the Northwest Passage. People gave up on Central America. <clears throat> they thought, okay, well, maybe all these lakes in Canada are the way. Okay, the last time somebody looked for a water route through North America to the Pacific Ocean, <coughs> Lewis and Clark, which is in the early 1800s. So it's going to be a while before people quit trying to find a natural route through the the Americas, all right? So, in 1504, <clears throat> Niccolo Machiavelli is living in France and is learning firsthand about what it looks like when the strength of a nation is united, more or less, under a single ruler, rather than under split up various centers of power like Italy or what we will eventually call Germany, okay? Machiavelli is Italian for very small head. No, I'm just kidding. That's not what he means. Um, Machiavelli did not disguise his dislike for Christianity in his writing. He felt that it, the exaltation of humility and meekness and patience in Christian doctrine undermined the social and patriotic instincts of mankind, right? He thought, okay, no, we have a natural desire for ambition and survival and Christianity is wrong to suppress that. Okay, so he did not like Christianity. He especially did not like the Pope and the Holy See. 
he felt that a unified Italy was the best thing that could ever happen to Italy and Italians. Um, but the Holy See was in the way. And the way Machiavelli expressed it, it was the Pope was too weak to control the whole peninsula, but too strong to allow any other state to bring about unity. Okay, so he has nothing good to say about the Popes, about the Italian politics of the Popes. Um, at one point, he did try and get a spot in the court of both Pope Leo X and then Clement VII, but it wasn't because he liked the church. On the other hand, when it was time to die, as happens with a lot of these Renaissance figures, um, uh, Machiavelli did, did die a Christian death with the sacraments, though his life, his habits, his writing had been pretty much pagan. Um, very typical representative of the Italian Renaissance. Someone who kind of tries to have his cake and eat it too. He wants to criticize the church, but when it's time to die, he wants he wants all the goodies. He doesn't want to go to hell. So, there you go. Now, <clears throat> this will be a long slide. Sorry. We've got Machiavelli on the table now, so we're going to stop and we're going to talk about humanism. Okay, Humanism was not invented by Machiavelli. It's been around over 100 years ago, over 100 years. Um, sometimes Dante, a poet named Petrarch, they're usually considered the first humanists. I mentioned last century, Pope Nicholas V was a patron of the arts and cons was considered a humanist. But now humanism has a much stronger influence over society. It's much more common. So we're going to figure that out now. So humanism is the name given to the intellectual, literary, and scientific movement of the 14th to 16th centuries, which aimed at basing every branch of learning on the literature and culture of classical antiquity. Okay, 14th to 16th centuries, a movement which aimed at basing every branch of learning on the literature and culture of classical antiquity. Okay, the humanists believed that classical training alone could form a perfect man. Um, they took their name humanist in as an op opposition to the scholastics, and they adopted a term, um, which we would say today, the humanities, to refer to this whatever scholarship and learning the ancients had. Okay, though the interval between the classical period, that'd be ancient Greece and Rome, and the um, where the humanists are in the Renaissance. They regarded that period as barbarous and destructive, okay? But um, in fact, humanism was very much connected with all of that barbaric past that they pretended to ignore, okay? The use of Latin, for example, in the liturgy of the church uh, had been going on for centuries. That was not something that the humanists thought of. Um, classical literature was read, okay, during the Middle Ages, but it wasn't read in its original, it was, it was read in translations and in commentaries written by um, priests and bishops, written by theologians, okay? Why? Okay, the church felt that the worldly conception of life, right, a, a life that did not refer to eternity, the, you know, the afterlife, the last things, the worldly conception of life in classical philosophy was an allurement to sin, okay? So they discouraged that kind of learning. Well, now something called secularism, which is trying to create a philosophy that doesn't involve the church, is becoming popular and humanism is a huge part of that, okay? Worldly pleasure becomes a strong factor in life. And what we used to call the transcendentals, okay? Um, something that reminds us we are meant for something beyond the earthly world is replaced by a human or naturalistic view where the most important thing is us, the way we relate to each other, the way nature relates to us, the art, the literature, the architecture, everything that we make. Okay, so this new spirit of of thought and philosophy breaks away from theology and the church. Okay, so that's the origin of humanism, is instead of seeing us in reference to God as, as creation, as part of creation, it sees everything in relation to us. The most important thing is man 
and then we figure everything else out based on that instead of beginning with God. So what's wrong with that, right? They put the people first, but they're at least going to church, right? Okay. The problem is the liberalism that you were studying at the beginning of the year, okay? And, and liberalism does not mean what we mean like in 2020 with politics, okay? Liberalism coming from Liber, coming from the idea of individual freedom, okay? What you were studying at the beginning of the year for the 1800s, the, the French Revolution and then into the 1800s, took only the worst parts of humanism and turned it into a way of, of life, okay? That's the problem with humanism. Humanism should and could have been a rebirth of learning, a renewed appreciation for our relationship with God by better understanding the whole of human history and whole of human learning, all right? Instead, liberalism turned humanism into a weapon, into a war against anything that restrains our behavior. Okay, so this picture here, this is a, a, a behavior wheel <laughs> from the Humanist Society's website today. I, this is from today. You can go to this website today, right now. These 10 commitments are supposed to replace the 10 commandments. What's wrong? Notice anything? What's wrong with these 10 commitments? Okay, they sound good, but these each have to be interpreted by you. What does humility mean to you? What does empathy mean to you? Okay, the individual's um, primary importance means humanism becomes totally subjective, right? What if my altruism, I think altruism means preventing you from getting an abortion. What if your empathy means letting somebody burn down a church in the name of equality? Right. Anyone can can define any of these terms exactly the way they want. You see how fast it falls apart. OK, so humanism took away the focus on God and said, hey, uh, people aren't stupid. They, they know they got to follow some rules or they'll go to hell. And then liberalism took that away. So we learn about the humanists. We need to pay attention to them because this is um, like in geometry. Right. And diverging lines. It doesn't have to be a very big angle at the beginning for down the road as, as the lines diverge for the distance apart to become very, very great. Okay, so humanism is really the first step toward the revolutionary ideology, the liberalism, the secular atheism that we were dealing with, what that you were dealing with at the beginning of the year with your original textbook. It does not lead anywhere pretty. I'm like really harping on this. You know, deal with it. Being able to identify the source ideology or philosophy for some of our problems today is very important. This is the purpose of studying history. It's not to memorize the names of dead people and figure out who, why the King of England couldn't figure out any of his stuff. Okay. Equality, justice, good wages, educational opportunities, these are all things that sound good, right? And if you don't understand the history behind these things, okay, you can accidentally start agreeing with things that you don't actually agree with, okay? These good ideas are used as a mask, and behind them, there's an ideology that refuses to acknowledge the existence of God and our primary relationship toward him okay in the end every single person deciding what's good and what's bad is a recipe for disaster okay that's what humanism does humanism says you decide there is no absolute truth there is no absolute standard okay knowing when it starts how it starts is very important okay and and what happens what's the response at the time the church did not do a good job combating this initially, okay? They basically said, no, that's wrong, okay? And it's coming from individual human leaders who are what? Who are, who are very, who are corrupt, right? So it comes across as this hypocrisy, okay? So by the time Leo XIII comes along in the 1800s, these other early modern popes 
and clearly, comprehensively explain the church's social teachings. Okay, they explain how faith and human flourishing, how faith and learning, how faith and freedom, properly understood, are very much compatible. It's really too late. The cat is out of the bag. Okay, so as we go forward, right, you've got to really look carefully. You've got to peel apart good ideas from really very bad ones. Okay, so this is this is a key moment. This would have been something very, very important to understand, you know, going into the textbook that you were using in the fall. All right, so lecture over. Let's see how quickly I can get through a lot of slides. <clears throat> so. In 1509, a Dutch humanist, now you know what a humanist is, named Erasmus, writes a book called In Praise of Folly. And this is a cold-blooded, undisguised, deliberate attempt to discredit the church. Okay, it's a satire. It's, um, it's a commentary on, again, surprise, you want to guess? Ecclesiastical corruption. Okay, there's, and Erasmus had an unhappy childhood. His parents died early. His um, guardians did not want him. He was kind of shuffled around. He was forced into a couple different monastery schools where he was not happy. And um, he basically had only seen the bad side of church organization and scholastic education. Um, so he takes that childhood trauma and turns it into a lifetime of, of really hating the church. All right. Um, he was friends with people like um, Thomas More and others and he wrote with them and tried to make sense of uh, the issues that he had. For example, um, a philosopher named Collet was, tried to show him, you know, you can reconcile ancient faith with humanism. You can, um, you can study the scriptures, the scholastic method. You know, if it bothers you, you can, you know, try these other things. Um, but he he really doesn't. Uh, translate all of that into um into anything positive he, he he latches on to scripture and scriptural understanding um as key as maybe the only worthwhile thing and so he did not at any point become a heretic but the things that he wrote make him basically the intellectual father of of protestantism of, of what we call the reformation you know the protestant revolt um, what the Reformation destroyed in public, Erasmus had already subverted in his writings. Okay, um, Erasmus blames all of this on what he, and I quote, what he called the primitive Christological controversies, which Erasmus said caused the church to lose its evangelical simplicity. Okay, so that's interesting because like primitive Christological controversies means those heresies that we studied like whether Christ is really God or whether he had two souls and all that stuff, right? From what century? How long ago was that? So it kind of makes us ask, A, what, what church do you have in mind? Like, just like from when the apostles were still alive? And B, what do you propose should have been done about heresies way back when, right? He has nothing to say about that. So it's not really a fair position, um, but his ideas get a lot of traction, a lot of people um, uh, I like what he writes. So this is a famous, famous portrait by Hans Holbein the Younger, um, who's a, a well-known Dutch painting, and it's from 1523, so it's it's very close to the time he was actually living. Next, in 1512, Michelangelo finishes the Sistine Chapel. Okay, uh, this is something you've kind of got to see to believe. It's amazing. It's an epic piece of art. Um, it's really impressive. And I put it here because it's easier to see. This is another video you can watch. It's not short at all. This is if you have, maybe put it on the background while you're doing something. I don't know. Um, it's almost an hour. But it shows, it's the details of the restoration of the chapel that was done in the 1990s. Uh, it's good if you're interested in art or our techniques or our history or want kind of a 90s video about, <laughs> about Rome with the British narration, this is for you. So, 1514, Portuguese traders reach what is today called Indonesia. And in 1517, the first Portuguese ship arrives at um, Guangzhou, which we would say Canton, which is in southern China. Okay, so the blue is Portuguese travels, 
the red are trade routes. 1517, they've made it all the way to China. Also in 57, this guy, must I tell you who it is? An Augustinian priest and professor of theology named Martin Luther compiles a list of 19 theses, which are objections or concerns or topics he would like to debate, however you want to describe them. And he um, sends them to the archbishop in Wittenberg. It's like, hey, these are my issues. Somebody come talk to me in public because I want to preach. Could we talk about him for several hours? Yes. Is he important? Yes. Are we going to? No. We are only 17 years into this century so far. It's already been 20 minutes. Sorry. We're going to handle Martin Luther some other way. Instead, in 1521, Charles V has been elected the Holy Roman Emperor. Okay. And Pope Leo X forms an alliance with the emperor against Martin Luther. And really, this means against the German princes who are supporting Martin Luther. Okay. Unfortunately, King, uh, King Francis of France huh, does not like Charles. Um, an Italian war begins where Francis invades um, this purple area, part of the purple area, and, and Navarre. He invades the Low Countries, which is part of the orange at the top. Um, Francis makes an alliance with the Republic of Venice. Henry VIII sides with Charles and the Papal States. Um, it's extremely complicated. This map <laughs> is what's keeping the Pope and the Emperor preoccupied while Martin Luther preaches. Okay, the political conflicts of Europe prevent there being an immediate organized response to the threat that Luther poses. Okay, and this, 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 you could argue, is, is what allowed the spread of Lutheranism. Instead of him being, um, you know, shut down, like Jan Hus, he's allowed to preach for a number of years. There's no council called to have him defend himself because everyone's too busy fighting over Europe. In 1521, Hernán Cortés, who is a Spanish explorer uh, with cannons and uh, an army of some Spaniards and some locals, some Indians, attacks the Mexica capital city at Tenochtitlan, which is Mexico City. And uh, the people don't have any guns. They uh, are sick with smallpox. They don't have a water supply. Um, they're killed by the thousands. And the, the Mexica, which is all you know, the Aztecs, are defeated by Cortés. Lots to say here, gonna skip it. In 1525, King Francis of France is defeated at the Battle of Pavia. He's taken prisoner. Fan, pran, bleh, sorry, France fails to regain territories in Italy that they used to control. But that's not what this painting is about. <laughs> Francis was not a great conqueror, but he was a great patron of the arts. The thing that eventually becomes the Louvre, the, the, the art museum in Paris, right? the great art collection of the French kings, begins with Francis I. Okay, so to help you remember the guy who screwed it up for Catholicism by distracting everyone from Martin Luther, Francis I of France, this painting is Francis receiving the last breath of da Vinci. All right, so now you remember that forever. This refers to a legend that he was so, uh, you know, in love with art that he, when he found out da Vinci was dying, da Vinci did die in, in France, he went to his deathbed and wanted to be near him so he could capture his last breath, the spirit of the artist. I don't know. Anyway, so can't unsee that. In 1531, German Protestants formed the Schmalkaldic League. Um, to defend themselves against the Holy Roman Emperor and the surrounding Roman Catholic states. Um, it's a six-year compact that says if any one of us is attacked militarily, uh, the rest of us will treat it as an attack against ourselves and we will resist as a group. Okay, and here's your all your wax seals of everybody that signed on to this, right? Because that's pretty cool. That's a lot of wax seals, especially considering the fact that it's 500 something years old and it's still in one piece, it's pretty cool. All right, so you may remember our friends, the Inca from last century. Their empire has reached its greatest extent. It is now 1532. In South America, a Spaniard named Francisco Pizarro 
arrives in Inca territory with 102 men, 62 horses, and a couple interpreters, and he defeats the forces of the Incan emperor. Period. That's it. It's kind of like over and done. Um, this photograph of Pizarro, I believe, is the earliest uh, artistic representation we have of a partial duck face. Um, yeah, I don't know. This guy would have been dangerous with a front-facing camera, I think. Okay, so in 1535, Henry VIII breaks from Catholicism and declares himself head of the English church. And again, could we say a bajillion things about this guy? Yes. Do we have time for it? No. He goes through six wives. The purpose of going through this many wives is to try and get a male heir. He needs a son to become king. He has a daughter. He's got two of those. Um, but he needs a son because the way British laws um, work you can't you can't pass your kingness to your daughter so anyway we're gonna skip in 1538 a pirate named Barbarossa is being paid by the Ottoman Empire to destroy the Christian fleets of, of the Pope Venice and Spain which he does and the Ottoman Empire now dominates the Mediterranean Sea who cares Christendom cares this is a huge problem in case you hadn't noticed, uh, pretty much all of the Christian West is either on the Mediterranean, physically on it with a coastline, or relies on the trade which crosses it continuously. So loss of control, a lack of safety for trade on the Mediterranean is a serious, serious bad problem. In 1541, a Protestant, another protester named John Calvin, is driven out of France. Okay, so the closest thing we have to Calvinism today it would be like Presbyterianism. Um, Calvin believed in predestination, denied all the sacraments except baptism. He said there was no such thing as natural revelation, which means it was impossible. He believed it was impossible for you to learn anything whatsoever about God by saying, oh, look, there's nature. Something must have created it. No not okay. Uh, he was against celibacy, and like most other Protestants, <clears throat> he mixed his political ideology up in with his theology very, very thoroughly. That's what get, got him kicked out of France. Okay, he was questioning um, the authority of the king, the authority of the pope, the authority of anybody, really. Um, so that's John Calvin. Very important. Not going to talk about him anymore. In 1542, Francis Xavier, a Portuguese Jesuit, lands in Goa, which is in, in India. If you want to click this link, this is the text of a letter Francis sent back to his superiors in Rome, and it describes his success in India and some of the, the conflicts, um, the like philosophical, ideological conflicts that arose in debates between him and the Brahmin religious leaders who were the leaders in India. Um, it's very interesting. Keep going. Okay, 1545, the Council of Trent, which was the 19th ecumenical council of the Roman Catholic Church, begins, and it's going to be on and on, off again until 1563. This is the church's response to all these heresies and criticisms and calls for reform, which have going on, been going on now for well over 100 years. Okay, despite constant interruptions, drama, uh, physical dangers, invasions, nonsense, plagues, you name it. The council covered an immense amount of ground, okay? Um, there have only been two church councils since Trent, okay? Vatican I, which we talked about, right? That was a response to liberalism. And then Vatican II, that's it. Everything else, the, the text of the catechism comes from Trent. The form of the mass, the old, the, the Latin mass comes from Trent. Okay. Um, very few things <laughs> have been changed since what came out of Trent. It was really an amazing accomplishment. This was the reform that the church needed. Okay. The ownership of property, the wealth of prelates, the structure of the hierarchy, all of those things were handled. Okay. Um, official replies to the theological problems in Luther, um, Lutheranism, Calvinism, some of these, um, the, the um, Protestant protesters, um, all of that was answered very thoroughly by Trent. 
it was it was an amazing thing in 1553 uh henry viii dies his son edward is king briefly and then edward dies and he is succeeded by mary this is henry's daughter from his first wife and she reestablishes Roman Catholicism as England's state religion. In 1554, she marries the Catholic King of Spain, sorry, Prince of Spain, he's not the king yet, um, Philip. And this marriage um, gives Spain influence in England's affairs. You may imagine uh, English people don't really like that very much. Well, there's a lot of objection to some of the things that she does. <clears throat> but the good news for the English is she only reigns for about four more years. And then she dies from, from illness. She'd been sick most of her adult life. I think she may have had um, cancer or some kind of some problem like that. But so she dies. Um, her half-sister Elizabeth, who was the daughter of Henry VIII and his second wife, will take the throne. Okay. Um, Mary was a pretty capable politician. She, uh, she did quite a lot in her short reign. Um, many historians think that her policies failed, not really because she was, she was on the wrong track, but she didn't have a lot of time to establish them. Okay, in other countries, for example, um, the Catholic Counter Reformation was carried out mostly by Jesuit missionaries. Okay, and, and they were very successful. But Mary had a religious advisor, Cardinal Pole, who did not like the Jesuits and did not want them allowed into England. So that was, you know, that was an error. Um, I already mentioned the marriage to Philip was very unpopular. And, um, she was the reigning monarch when France recaptured the port of Calais and took that away from the English. Okay. Um, they also, almost the entire time she was queen, there were there was a famine because of unusually wet weather. Okay, well, people don't like that. Um, so anyway, although she was ultimately in, ineffectual and was always very unpopular, she instituted fiscal reform, right, a banking reform, an expansion of the Navy and programs of colonial exploration that are always credited to her sister Elizabeth as these great Elizabethan accomplishments and they were really all things that Mary initiated so a little bit underappreciated in 1566 um, again there's some famine problems grain prices are high the people get agitated and um, inspired by Calvinist preachers they take axes and sledgehammers and attack what they believe is false doctrine, and they do that by smashing up uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Antwerp. Uh, they, they smash the altar, they break all the glass windows, the ornaments, the paintings, they desecrate the tombs, destroy books, ecclesiastical vestments, manuscripts, they trash the entire cathedral. All right, And this spreads more in the Netherlands. In 1568, um, Prince William of Orange, who is a Dutch nobleman, leads a revolt against the rule of the Catholic monarch, who is Philip II of Spain, because Spain owns the Netherlands right now. And this is the beginning of the 80 years war, okay? It's gonna spread to other places and Protestant leaders use the religious drama, um, this, this spirit, this iconoclasm, to stir up the people and gain support for their political wars. Okay, in 1571, uh, a battle is fought between the Christians and the Turks near a place called Lepanto. Okay, so Lepanto has been occupied by the Turks for almost 100 years. Okay, and this is the victory in which a papal Spanish, Venetian, and Genoese combined fleet defeats the Turkish fleet on seven, uh, October 7th, 1571. Okay. Um, Though the victory didn't really accomplish anything too permanent, okay, the, the Turks do reappear the next year with a new fleet, um, but it was a very important moral victory for the Christians. That's the first time anybody had managed to defeat the Turks on the sea, okay? And the Pope at this time is one of the greats in all of Christian history. This is Pius V, okay? He's a man who proved 100% there could and would <laughs> Be good, holy men in charge of the church. He was a great reformer, a personally pious, just, not corrupt man. 
Okay, so Pius V attributed the victory at Lepanto to the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and he instituted the Feast of Our Lady of Victory, which very soon became Our Lady of the Rosary, like within a couple years, um, to celebrate this um, victory. So the, the story was, as the battle was ending, Pius was was working in his in his palace, in his office, and he stood up and he went to the window and was looking out east where, toward where Lepanto would be. Way, way, I mean, it's hundreds. It's not visible, <laughs> but he's looking up at the sky and he cries out. And he said, a truce to our business, meaning stop what you're doing. A great task at present is to thank God for the victory, which he has just given our Christian army. Okay, and so um, some people see, say he saw a vision. That's what's in this painting. He saw a vision of Mary um, helping the uh, the commanders of the fleet. There you go. All right, in 1572, something bad happens, regrettable thing. August 24th, which is St. Bartholomew's Day, between two and 3,000 Protestants in the city of Paris and around the city are killed. All right. Um, Catholics across Europe are, are excited. Protestants are sad, okay, because the, the name of these French Protestants are called Huguenots, and they've been causing all kinds of problems and um, leading to civil unrest, to um, a lot of retaliatory, oh, you burn your church, our, our church will burn yours, um, disorder, it's, it's been a problem in France. They've been having these religious wars for a number of years. Okay, so the question is, did the Pope and the Catholic kings want 2,000 people, mostly just ordinary citizens in, in Paris and around the city, to be killed? Or is this something that they didn't think through very well and got out of hand? Okay, so... Um, the idea of, of arresting and executing the Protestant leaders was definitely something that was endorsed by the Catholic leaders, okay? So Catherine de' Medici, who was the wife of Henry II, you don't need to know all these names, and the mother of several kings of France, um, had always thought that would be useful, and her sons agreed, the various sons she had who were kings, yes, getting the, you know, cutting off the head of the serpent, so to speak, getting these leaders and executing them will help us reestablish peace in the country. Okay. Now, um, what be, what turns into the massacre, though, is a political thing. It's not really religious. Okay. Um, the, um, sorry, I've got to, <laughs> I'm going to skip a little bit. All right, so um, a man named Coligny, an admiral, um, was identified as this is the guy that we definitely need to execute. But what ends up happening is instead of arresting him and putting him on trial, he's basically assassinated. Um, the, the operatives go to his house at night, he's killed, and they start going from house to house to these Protestant leaders and killing them, and they completely lose, lose control. Okay, this becomes a horrible massacre. The mob in Paris is stood up, stirred up. They start attacking the houses of all the rich. Okay, like not all of their victims are actually Huguenots and just killing people indiscriminately. And it's really, really a terrible, terrible thing. Okay, um, there's, there's no evidence that the Pope thought this was a good idea. Um, all he says when it's done is, well, okay, well, glad Francis Catholic again and kind of leaves it at that. Um, this is really isn't the end of the story, though. The, the Huguenots and the Catholics continue to fight for a number of years. In 1575, um, we haven't talked about Japan in a long time. So Japan has been in, in sort of various, you know, disorder, order, disorder, going back and forth. Um, now a guy named Oda Nobunaga is expanding his personal control of Japan. And um, he wins a battle using an army that's carrying muskets. So that's exciting. He also has been exploring the idea of ironclad ships. And um, he's building roads. So this is an interesting guy. This is a picture of his, his actual battle armor. It's in a museum. And this is a time of flourishing in Japan. Um, Oda... Um, unifies most of the area we think of as modern Japan. And this is also the peak of missionary activity. Okay, in 1579, 
at the height of missionary activity in Japan, there are 130,000 converts to Catholicism. Okay, so the Japanese mission is the largest overseas Christian community that was not being ruled by a European power, right? It's not a European colony. It's an independent, it's, it's Japan. Okay, so that's really interesting. In 1577, a Jesuit missionary named Matteo Ricci arrives at Macau, which is in the, the coast, southern coast of China. And he will become the first European to enter the forbidden city of Japan, of, sorry, ah, forbidden city of Beijing, um, where he's invited in by the emperor who wants his, wants him to teach some of his advisors about astronomy and science, some things that he knows. Um, Matteo Ricci is very interesting. This is a Chinese portrait of him. Um, and then the map shows the red line is his journeys from Macau north to Beijing. In 1580, King Philip of Spain declares William of Orange, who is the Dutch revolutionary guy, an outlaw. Uh, this is due to a number of things. One of them is that he's Protestant, yes. But William had also been part of like a billion different intrigues and coups and things trying to um, control the path of succession for various countries, mostly England, and trying to make sure that a Protestant king, Protestant monarch is in control in England. So he's kind of a political busybody. It's not just that he's Protestant. Well, that doesn't help. In 1586, an Italian humanist named Bernardino Telesio, Bernardino Telesio publishes a series of books basically trashing Aristotle. Okay, so, and he what he's doing is rejecting metaphysics, which is kind of philosophy in favor of knowledge based on experience and experiment. Okay, some people call him the first systematic scientist. Today we'd probably say empirical scientist. And that'd be somebody who conducts experiments and draws conclusions based on what they observe, right? This is really too bad. Aristotle has a lot of value, even for the modern empirical sciences, okay? Metaphysics was never meant as a replacement for observation. Okay, it was supposed to be an examination of things at a deeper level, right? The philosophical perspective. There are some things you can't do an experiment on. Metaphysics is supposed to be a guide for thinking about those things. And yeah, it's not how Talesio felt, so. So this is another humanist. This humanist is now rejecting classical learning because he doesn't agree with it. He doesn't think that it is properly focused on humans and what we can see and sense and feel and all that stuff. In 1587, Philip II of Spain is trying to get rid of Elizabeth of England, who is a Protestant. He wants to replace her with Mary Stuart, who is the Queen of Scotland and a Catholic. Okay, so Mary is kind of the, the, the rallying cry for everybody in England who doesn't like Elizabeth. All right. Um, Mary is, this is a uh, Mary on the left, and she's shown with her son, James. This is just a composite portrait. They weren't ever together. Like, this is not a drawing from them sitting together in a drawing room. This is two different portraits that are put together as one piece. Um, because Mary was separated from James when he was a baby, and she spent most of her, her life in prison actually, so that she couldn't become the queen. And eventually Elizabeth solves the problem by having Mary beheaded. Um, and that's that. No more threat from Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1588, Pope Sixtus V says, uh, that's not nice. You can't execute queens. He tells Philip he'll help finance an invasion of England. An English fleet confronts the Spanish Armada of more than 100 ships and 30,000 soldiers that are supposed to go invade England. And Elizabeth's smaller, better built, more maneuverable, etc., 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 ships scatter Philip's armada. And out of more than 100, only 65 of Philip's ships make it back to port, many of which are damaged. This is an overly dramatic representation of um, the encounter of the British fleet, English fleet, and the Spanish armada. All right, there's a new boss in town in Japan. Um, this is him down in the corner. Toyotomi Hideyoshi is the ruler of Japan. 
And by 1591, he has consolidated his rule, right? Everything that Nobunaga wanted to do, Hideyoshi has done, and he's made it permanent. Four years before, he expelled the Jesuits and made Christianity illegal. Everybody who didn't disappear quick um, is put to death. So this painting is of the martyrs of Nagasaki and quite a few Jesuit martyrs. Um, and it's, it's usually a couple Jesuits and a bunch of, of Japanese um, parishioners, basically, that are all killed together. So that's this painting. That's the end of Christianity in Japan for quite a long time. In 1593, Galileo develops the first thermometer. And I'm sorry, I couldn't find a really good picture or even a diagram of an original. Basically, Galileo used a what was predictable, which is the behavior of liquids when they're heated and cooled, to show changes in temperature. Um, this is before there's a standard scale for what to call those degrees, right? Exactly how far apart is a degree, things like that. Comes a little later, but he did he did come up with a thermometer. And this picture of, is of a reproduction that somebody made for a museum. So it looked something like this, probably without the creepy puppet initially. Um, but this is the idea, right? The liquid in the bottom is heated by what's happening in the atmosphere and how far, how much liquid rises into the tube corresponds to the temperature. All right, so we haven't talked about France since the uh, very terrible massacre. Um, they've been fighting this whole time. May not surprise you. Anyway, in 1598, France's wars of religion come to an end. And some balance of tolerance, some kind of toleration between the Catholics and the Protestants is proclaimed by Fran the King Henry IV, who's the King of France, in a document called the Edict of Nantes, which is the city where it's signed. Now, um, important document. It is, in fact, a document of religious tolerance. Okay, it, it's quite long. And it establishes some things that the Protestants like and some things that the Catholics like and a bunch of things that neither of them like, as every other compromise in history. So, first of all, um, places where the Catholic re religion was wanted but being suppressed had to be allowed to go back to being Catholic. Okay, so if there was a region a place in France where people were mostly Catholic and were being harassed by Huguenots, they had to be left alone, okay? The property of the clergy had to be returned. And the Huguenots were allowed to freely exercise their religion anywhere where it, it already existed. And then they were given a kind of a complicated list of how far they'd be allowed to expand, okay? Two localities in every bailiwick, which doesn't mean anything to us, but... It would be similar to if they said, okay, well, there aren't any Huguenots in Fort Worth, but you can have two parishes in the diocese, and then that's it. No more Huguenots in Fort Worth. It would be something like that, okay? Um, and there were exceptions. If there was a lord who had a castle and he had a sufficiently high rank, he could have a Huguenot chapel in his, cha in his castle and anyway, things like that. And the Huguenots were allowed to run for public office. They could be admitted to colleges. They could hold religious synods. And they could have political meetings. Because, again, these also a political party. So um, this, is, this is new, right? This pretty benevolent and explicit tolerance, a document that says they have to be tolerated, was new for the Huguenots. And, of course, they don't like it. A lot of them think they got too little. A lot of the Catholics think they got way too much. Um, Pope Clement VIII is really not happy. He complains quite a bit. And a lot of the local parliaments in France refuse for a long time to register the edict. They refuse to recognize it. Um, the Protestant, again, and that's both Protestant and Catholic. Eventually, it, it, it becomes pretty much the law of the land, and it does grant France a decent amount of time where they have religious peace. You still have Catholics harassing Huguenots. You still have Huguenots harassing Catholics. But it's not the all-out war that it had been for so many years. So, all right, I made it. That's it. A blank slide. Oops. Never mind. <laughs> the show is over. Check out the uh, sources. I made it under 50 minutes. I'm proud of myself. Two more centuries to go. We're almost there. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.